Does everyone hear me well? Awesome. How's everybody doing? I can't hear you. Woo. <laughs> All right, today we're going to talk about building a sync engine enclosure. So what is this about? I think it's about this. It's getting really hard to write software. You know, compare, let's say you're building 2009 GitHub, right? For 14, 15 years ago, how, uh, how would it be? All you'd have to do you know, is make databases, maybe some controllers, and templates. Now, if you were building GitHub again in 2024, what the heck is going on, guys? You know, what ISR, server components, SSR, React, serverless, WebSockets, JavaScript, IndexedDB, right? Does it, you know, how did we get here? How, how has it become so hard? Well, one theory is that it's because of the Federal Reserve Bank. So maybe, you know, we've gotten lax and uh, things, were, things were harder before. But I actually think that's not the case. I think what's going on is that we're writing a different kind of software and we're missing the tools to make writing this software easy. Uh, so what are these tools and how can we build them, right? To answer this question, I'm gonna take you on a journey. We're gonna look at how we built software since the dawn of basically computing and eventually we will get to an actual implementation of a sync engine by the end of this talk. All right, let's do this. Oh yeah, and we'll talk about how awesome Clojure was in order to build it. So if you look at how software was built, I think this diagram kind of covers it. It's like almost like a, so a cycle in architectures. And the very first place we'll start, we'll start in the 50s. So if you look at that, that's the IBM 7090. You know, if we compare that to a computer today, it doesn't really even look like a computer, but that's what, what it was, right? And at that time, this cost about $3 million, which would be equivalent to having three private jets, 10-seater um, uh, private jets, right? In programming, you would have to use punch cards, right? And you'd have to use a, a hole puncher <laughs> to punch the cards. All right, okay, the hole puncher is a joke. Um, there, was a, there was people typed on punch cards. But, you know, the way that this worked was super frustrating. You would, have to, you, you, you would write out these punch cards in a room, right? Eventually, you would give it to an operator, and then a few days later, you would know the answer to your question, like, you know, did, did your code actually work? So, you know, and you'd wait in these lines. Like, these people are not actually waiting for Star Wars. They're waiting for getting access to the computer, right? So this is just how things were, but you know, it was in the 1950s. Uh, it was batch processing, so at the end of the day, just the fact that you could get compute, that was already amazing, right? Now the big con here was that throughout the entire system, the assumption was that human time was less good than computer time, right? Even compilers were, weird because like why would you get a, a computer to uh, you know compile code where a human can do it cheaper but not everybody was happy with this situation does anyone know who this guy is John McCarthy not only did this guy invent Lisp but he also invented time sharing right and around this time you know, because of the way that the scaling laws work, worked for these IBM computers, everyone assumed that the bigger the computer was, the more efficient it would be for, in terms of price. So they would think about computers like utilities, like a nuclear power plant where you, you, you kind of give data, uh, you know, give compute time out. So something like this, right? And John McCarthy, he, he sat out and he wrote out an architecture for how how we could share one giant computing utility across many people. And it would look kind of like this, like it would be terminals that you would access a central computer, and then you would you get a slice of compute time. He called it time stealing, right? And you know, when you squint at that, that's actually just like the first server-based architecture, right? Our web apps of like 
20, 2005 have a very similar architecture to that, right? And the benefit of this was that you could finally debug your code. You didn't have to wait days to get an answer. Now, you didn't have your own computer, and that's the main con, but at this time, so what? You, you also didn't have your own power plant, right? So this was the 60s, right? And one interesting thing happened. Because before in the 50s, you know, batch processing was so serious, people only used computers for serious things. But, you know, now that you have this terminal, you can start asking, like, what else can you do with computers? What if I can draw on computers? What if I can communicate with other people at computers, with computers, right? So people started experimenting, right? And, uh, you know, I'm going to take us over here. Do we know where this place is? Xerox Park, right? A bunch of these people who are thinking about using computers in different ways get together, and they're tasked with creating the office of the future, right? Um, now, you, you might imagine, like, you, you know, they're known for making the first personal computer, but how did they actually imagine, initially, this office of the future was going to look like? Well, they still thought that everything would be server-based. So the very first thing they built was this central computer, right? And they thought that you would have terminals, and you would use GUIs and all these things uh, uh, through a central computer. But very quickly, they realized, like, in order to draw things, like, it's just, it was just n no central computer was powerful, powerful enough to do this, right? So they kind of got into this, this problem. But just around this time, these new mini computers are coming out, right? And this was like $12,000 all in, which is still a lot of money. But, you know, now, now people thought, wait a minute, what if everybody could have their own computer? And, you know, this is Alan Kay showing showing like the, the beginnings, all right? He's doing a little cookie monster situation. Now, normally, uh, uh, I would say, you know, Xerox Park and th these guys created the personal computer, but some bad stuff happened in the, uh, in the upper echelon of, of Xerox executives. So that didn't work out. So these two gentlemen come in, right? And they put everything together and I would say, once the Macintosh is released, we get a whole new architecture yet again. So this is where client software is born, right? And the benefit of client software, now you actually can do these GUIs and these cool things. You have your own computer, but you're not networked. Now, this isn't so bad in the 1980s because there basically is no network, right? Ethernet just came out, not a lot of people know it. So famously, you know, Steve Jobs was once asked why on the Lisa uh, there was no Ethernet cable. And uh, he threw the floppy disk at this person, saying that that's your, that's your uh, Ethernet, right? Nobody really cared at this point. But, you know, as time goes on, right, a lot of, you know, client software is getting better and better. Where I would say in the 90s, we reached this kind of super cool climax. Yes, I'm giving Microsoft Word the climax because this was pretty freaking cool. Like, it was complicated software. It was fast. It worked everywhere. If you did decide to lug your giant personal computer into a plane, you could use it in a plane, um, which I, you know, I, I have heard people did this. So there's, there's some truth here, all right? But there were all these cons that started to come out too. First, it's like a pain to install, right? You take this, you know, you go to the store, you get this disc, but you're probably like a grandmother trying to run this, this thing, and you're going to get like a blue screen or something crazy, right? And shipping this was very difficult because now, because there's a release date, everybody has to go and kind of march to that date. Some bugs you just won't be able to fix in time. And because you don't control the whole system, you know, it's very hard to debug this, right? Uh, now, around this time, too, because the internet's coming out, email is becoming really important, suddenly, like, collaboration is important, right? But no, you can't really collaborate. You just have a bunch of files uh, strewn around everywhere over email, right? And it will only ever work, again, on your own machine. So that's the situation in the 90s. But again, more and more innovation's happening. And Netscape comes out, right? And some people have this idea. They say, wait a minute. Instead of writing like Windows software, I can just rely on the browser to be my platform, and I can make apps on that, 
right? So they make, you know, via web was uh, controversially, but I, I think at least me looking into it, they were, I think, the first web app, right? Amazon comes out, um, and then Salesforce, you know, eventually in 2000 says, software is over. Everything's a web app, right? And bada bing, we're back to server-based apps, right? And you get a, all these pros again, right? When you have a server-based app, you don't need to install anything, right? It's easy to ship because you, you have the system, you just push code, everybody gets the latest version. It's easy-ish, easier to collaborate because the data is in a central place. And it works on all machines. But around this time, you know, the reality is reality. Like, you know, if, you're, if you want to type a character and you have to wait for the server to come back, it's not going to be as fast as Microsoft Word, and it will not work offline, right? But there was a lot of pros for this. And I would say around to the 2000s, we built all these tools to make building server-based apps easier. So, you know, we come on with Clojure, with Rails, with jQuery, and, you know, suddenly you really can build billion-dollar companies in, like, a weekend or a month, right? I think the abstractions we created turned out, you know, I do think they worked. But something else was happening around this time, too, right? The browser was super dumb in 2001, right? But Chrome comes out, right? We start, you know, the WebSocket spec comes out. Do you guys know it was in 2008? Totally didn't know that. So, you know, Google Wave comes out, right? Etherpad. So all these super cool, cool products are coming out. And they have a, a very special characteristic. And it's not just server, and it's not just client anymore. It's server or client, right? It's, it's like happening. You know, you're getting the best of both worlds. It's like a hybrid, right? So if you can run code on the client, your stuff can be fast and it works offline. And if you can work, run code on the server, you don't need to install things. It's easy to ship, easy to collaborate, uh, and it works on all machines, right? Pretty cool. And I think if you actually look at some of the apps that have come out, I do think they somewhat deliver on this promise, right? So, you know, Look at these apps and think about it, like Figma, right? They all, or, or Notion or Linear, they respond instantly, right? Uh, let's say you're trying to, like, you know, make some to-dos, right? When you click the to-do app, right, you don't wait for the server to, to acknowledge it, right? You just immediately show it, right, and you get an optimistic update. Then once the, once the server returns, you kind of resolve it. And if you can build apps like this, all of a sudden, these apps have flow, right? They're not just kind of like clunky Jira style. Similarly, all these new apps, they're multiplayer by default, right? So if you're trying to make a document, and previously, you know, you would have this folder, and then you would have different design versions, right? And then eventually you get into this situation, right? Now you just use Figma. You, you know, it's one document. It's always up to date. You know, you, you can be on there, the designer can be on there, groups of people can be on there, and uh, it's just a much more fun workflow, right? And these things work basically everywhere. So, you know, you're about to get on the plane, you open up your Notion doc, you're ready to do some writing, right? And the plane goes up. Well, if you're using Notion, it just continues working, which is pretty cool. Um, and not only that, but when you, go, when you go offline, right, you get a bonus, which is when you load it the very first time, it might take some, some time to load, but the second time, you get it instantly. And these things kind of combine to build a really different kind of app, right? They're fast, they work offline, and it's just, uh, you know, I think it's a different uh, level of delight. But I know you guys might be thinking, something's missing here. What do you guys think is missing? The cons, guys. <laughs> Where's the cons, right? Well, it's a massive, massive schlep to build apps like this, right? Let's, let's actually see how much of a schlep it is. And maybe if we actually go through it, we'll come up with an architecture to fix it. So 
we're going to read data. We're going to make a to-do app, and we just want to show a screen with your to-dos. First, we're going to start with a DB. We're going to add to-dos and teams in there, right, and, and move on our merry way. Then we have to create kind of like JSON endpoints, right, or something, because you know, we want the client to talk to it, not through like templates, right? Then you know, we're going to paint the screens, right? No. OK, we're going to make sure that we're allowed to see what we're allowed to see, so we'll add some permission layer in there to, you know, to, to make sure it's OK. And generally, we usually get back all these endpoints give us data in, a, in, a, in this kind of tree-like way. But we want to normalize it, right? Because if, if we have the same user, right, and we want to change the name, for example, their favorite language from common list to closure, we want to make sure that we update it in both places. So one thing we do is we normalize the data in a single place so they're, they get activated everywhere. Right? And then we put it into a store. Now we could paint the screens, right? No, we can't because the screens, they're actually wanting to have trees of data as well, right? To-dos, have users, etc. So we now then need to kind of like reformat it back into this tree. So we need to denormalize the data, right? And this is just to paint the screen. What, what, what happens when things change? Well, OK, I'm going to delete this to do. Ship, forget about it, right? OK, we make our delete endpoint, and we, 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 you know, like, what do we actually do? We write this code, right? This looks OK, but you know, if we just write this, you know, nothing's going to show up on the computer, right? We need to show the change somehow. One option is we can refetch everything, but this again breaks this whole idea of a modern app, and it's going to feel slower, right? OK, we can do this ourselves then. So what do, we, what do we do to do this ourselves? Well, we need to remember where we have these to-dos, right? We delete it in the store, we find all the teams, and we delete it in the teams. So if you look at that code, Right? What are you really doing? Well, you're using your brain and you're trying to do this like reference counting where you're like, oh, where do I need to delete this to-do? In the to-do store, in the team store, in the metric store, right? And suddenly you get overwhelmed. Like our brains are not meant to be doing this, right? Uh, and this is just the beginning. Like what if you want to make optimistic updates? So here we await it in the front. Right? But that's going to still lead to a little bit of a lag. Well, we can move it to the bottom, and that'll do it. But what happens if the to-do API fails? Right? We need to write rollback. So OK, we'll write this try-catch. Right? And then you know, if it doesn't work, we'll, we'll roll it back. So OK, now we're re remembering again. Literally, we have to write the same reference uh, in the reverse order. right? And this is only an 80-20 solution, because there's a bug here. So watch this. We have our to-do app, right? I'm going to create the to-do, wake up. I'm going to write two immediate changes like this, eat snacks and hack. Well, if I do this, what happens if hack fails? Ideally, we should see eat snacks, right? Because that one succeeded. But the way we wrote this code, we're gonna actually going to have a reference to the very first to-do. So what we'll actually see is wake up, right? These are the kind of subtle bugs that you either don't deal with it or you end up having to do stuff like this. You create a queue on the front end, right, where you save all the changes you're making, and then now you can kind of undo it as things go along. All right, so now we have a queue. What about multiplayer, right? Okay, well, you know, instead of endpoints, now we have to think about sockets. It's so nice to just put a box, you know? <laughs> right? OK, let's, let, let's, let's go deeper. OK, if you want to make sockets, what you really need to do, and this is kind of like what most people do when they do this, is you create these topics for a page. You say, OK, this page is a team page, and I care about the team A, or the user B, uh, or it's a task list C, right? And uh, when, you save, when you make a change, you want to kind of find all these topics and then send the, the appropriate change to that front end. OK, well, how do you actually do that? Right? I, like, what do we do here? Uh, well, you have to do the exact same kind of reference counting again. When you ch save a to-do, what changes? Right? You think, you think, you think. 
and then it's like, you know, you might think you might need to change a user in a task later, but what about that newest list page you created, right? Constantly you're, you're keeping track of things. And you end up in this problem because if you get too specific, right, if you change this to do only make these topics, now your brain's just gonna overload. But if you get too general, like if you change it to do update every page, then you're just gonna unnecessarily uh, send updates, right? So but I mean, this is what you have to do. So I guess you write something like this. But now, what about notify? How the heck do you do notify, right? Because if you look at this, you know, if this was all on one machine, I guess you can make this happen. But generally, like, you have multiple machines. So if something changes on one machine, how do you tell the other machine, right? Well, you need some sort of queue, right? So in this case, maybe we'll, like, subscribe to the database, write ahead log, and then we can, you know, use that as our queue to kind of send updates over, over the sockets, which then update the front end, right? Finally, okay, we do this, but don't forget the race conditions, guys. So we have sockets, we have the front end, right? But generally, you know, you're, f you're querying for something and you're subscribing to it. Now, isn't it possible while you're querying, you'll get, you'll miss the subscription, right? So you need to have somehow synchronize these two things. Okay, that's another problem to solve, right? Uh, and if you do all of this, then you can get to offline mode, which, funny enough, if you do all of this, actually it's not that unreasonable, right? You can just store the to-do, uh, the, the, the store and the transaction queue in IndexedDB. There are things you have to think about here, like how much do you store? Do you store only partially? Like when do you know everything's okay? But if you do this, I think you'll get a modern app. Jesus. <laughs> right, that's, that's a lot of stuff to do. So when there's so much stuff to do, what do we do, guys? We go to the hammock, right? So let's think, is there a way that we can generalize this so we don't have to do all this stuff? Well, if you actually look at this diagram, like what are we really doing? Like, denormalize is just another word for querying, right? Like you have this normalized store and you write a query, you get back data in a sh the shape that you want, right? A store is actually literally just another name for a database, right? Uh, transaction queues, database, right? When you're getting data from the client to the server, you can think of it either as like partial replication or some sort of like, you know, a query for information that you want, right? Well, I think the big insight here is all these UI problems, they're database problems in disguise. So what if, you know, a database, you could just use it from the front end? Could we, could we make queries from the front end that are reactive by default, that have these optimistic updates for you if we had this abstraction? That's what we ended up kind of trying to do for the last two years, and uh, we open sourced uh, recently. So here I'm just gonna show you uh, the, um, the way that we've implemented it. So let's talk about building instance. Here's, here's the situation. You have a local DB. The first thing to solve is how do we get uh, these queries to be optimistic and to work offline? We could try using SQL, but uh, they're going to be really big bundles. If you use SQL, we have to push in SQLite, right? And how do you make these queries reactive, right? That's 1,700 page spec. Uh, you know, there's so many ways to write SQL. How are you going to make that reactive? Uh, also, there's another question, like, what are the queries you're writing on the front end? Very often, they look like these trees, right? Teams, tasks, owner. Well, you, you could write this kind of SQL query, but it's going to return one, one row. You definitely don't want that. You want this normal, like, denormalized structure. So here's what you'd have to do to make that. And now, this isn't like crazy advanced SQL, but it's also not simple. Right, so I think you know what this is sh showing us is like we need to go back on the drawing board, right? And it's like what are the queries we're actually making for these apps? Well, if you look at this, I think a lot of the time you have Notion, Figma, like all of these are just uh, graph queries, right? This might make you think graph queries. What is the simplest way to execute a graph query? 
triples, all right? We can just store triples in there, and bada bing, bada boom, uh, we get relations, right? And it, you don't need spec, you don't need, like, you don't even need a spec for a data log. It's, it takes like 100 lines to implement a basic version, and you're kind of ready to, ready to go, right? So that's what, what we ended up doing. We just, on the front end, we have a triple store, a transaction queue, they're persisted to IndexedDB, and we get optimistic updates in offline mode for free. Okay, but what about the queries? We could expose data log, but this can become problematic because you know, this isn't very close at hand for most front-end developers. Um, what if we make this friendlier, like GraphQL, but data? So this is exactly what we did. You know, I think a lot of the queries in the front end, they actually do look like these tree-like queries. So what if we gave you a tree-like looking object, right? And under the hood, this goes and just, just generates data logs so we can use the same kind of store. Um, and that's what we ended up doing. We made a light query engine on top that lets you write uh, these GraphQL-looking queries. Now, how do we make everything reactive? Do you remember these uh, topics, like task list A, user B? Well, we could just generate this for you, right? If you think about it, like, if you have a query like this, you can generate a kind of like data lock logging pattern or a topic in our case. And if you have a transaction, you can do the exact same thing. And now you can match against them. And if they match, you know that this query needs to change. And this is exactly the algorithm uh, that we use to make things reactive. We, ha we listen to the write ahead log. We have this internal query store, and uh, we kind of synchronize these um, queries and, and updates uh, in, inside this query store. And we get reactivity. So the final bit is, or the second to final bit is permissions. So here you have you know, this where clause. You're, you can write it from the client, right, from the front end. Similarly, you can write transactions, like what if somebody wants to hack you? We got to solve this. All right. Like this, aha, how are we looking, guys? Okay, so, um, you know, the, the goal is you can write queries, and you, sh we, we, you know, if the query results in like, let's say three posts, and you're not allowed to see one post, we should just hide it for you. Similarly, for transactions, if you can't make a transaction, we should fail. How do we do this? Well, we need something really expressive. Like, if you do things like role-based security only, there are things that it's just very hard to express where the data is dynamic, right? We need this to be embeddable because we want this to run very quickly in our own system, right, while we're making queries. Uh, it needs to be easy to sandbox so you can't break anybody else. It needs to be fast. Well, it turns out Google released, like, a language that's not Turing complete that you can compile into uh, inside the JVM, and it's, like, super, super fast. And because we're in Clojure, bada bing, we can use self Java, right? So that's exactly what we did. Users can write rules, and uh, we can execute these rules while we're making queries and transactions. The final problem in Instant to Solve is this global database. Where do we actually store users' data? And the, the main thing that we need to do account for is this. We want to make sure that users can have a real free tier. Right, where if you start a uh, project with us, we're never going to freeze you. We need to make sure that the data is relational, and we need room for scaling. So what we ended up with is a structure that looks kind of like this. All the data is stored in one database. We have an Aurora Postgres instance. And all the data is stored in one, one big table, because tables scale pretty nice uh, vertically. So what this lets us do uh, is uh, be because for us uh, an individual database is a, is a logical abstraction. It's just free for us to create it for, for users, right? Now, to make sure that people can only access the data that they're allowed to see, we created a query engine on top of this where you have to provide an app ID. So every query that we write to this database comes with an app ID, and they can only see the data that respects this app ID. Uh, and if you want to look a little bit deeper, this is kind of how the table looks actually under the hood. You know, we have this app ID for the multi-tenancy. We have adders, which are kind of a way to define a schema for a triple. And we do this pretty cool hack with Postgres, where if you, um, 
enable, they have this thing called partial indexes. So if we toggle these switches, we can save the triples in, in different indexes and make different queries faster. So that's how we did it for, for GlobalDB. Uh, and that's effectively what, how Instant works. Now, building this, we built it with a team of three. So we needed a secret weapon. Bada bing. Closure, right? How, how did it help? Here's how it helped. First, in exploration, right? It's great to solve problems that you've solved before, but this was certainly a problem we have not ever solved before. We didn't know what we, what, what we had to do, right? And I think having the REPL was basically crucial for us because we were exploring the space as we were building it. And second, having the REPL in production was also very helpful. I think uh, being able to REPL into production and change things, this has gotten kind of like a bad rep. You know, it's dangerous, you shouldn't need to do this. But, you know, a scalpel is dangerous too, right? And sometimes you have a bug and the only way that you'll be able to figure it out is if you can't go into the production REPL, right? And I think this has been invaluable for us. DSLs, right? Everybody talks about, oh yeah, you don't actually need domain-specific languages. We wrote like three or four different domain-specific languages in order to build Instant, right? And I think because of that, the size of the code base is very small, and we're able to do things like creating an app without you even having to sign in, right? If we didn't have this, this guarantee with the DSL, it would be very, very hard. Similarly with Clojure, there's no ceremonies. Right? I have a map, I want to put a vector as a key. What do I do? To just put it in, you know? Find, find by, by, by closure, right? I want to make a thread, boom, future. I, I want to do something with concurrency, boom, atom, right? These are very simple primitives, but we can use them so, so well, uh, and it keeps the complexity low. Similarly with vertical scaling, this is, a, I think, something that's also underexplored. In most languages, like, if you wanted to scale, what you do is you scale horizontally, right? You create a bunch of different machines. But what's the cost of that? When you, when you do that, you, know, you need to introduce something like Redis, right, to manage the, the shared state. You need to think about deployments. Like, this just gets a lot more complicated than having one box, for example, or, or less boxes. But with Clojure, you get options for both, right? You can scale horizontally, but you have access to threads, right? You can, you can scale really well vertically, too. And I think this also kind of extends our runway for the amount of complexity that we can take on. And finally, the JVM, right? Java Util Concurrent, wow. Guys, so good, right? And while we're working on this, right, trying to figure everything out, we look up, and guess what we see? Virtual threads have shipped. We have like a new garbage collector that's like super fast. We have, uh, you know, and then w if we ever need a library, we have some of the best libraries available, all right? And uh, that's, that's helped us move really fast. So that's my talk. You know, maybe all problems are database problems. So far, I think things in the app space are, but uh, I'm looking for more, more, more areas, right? If you, look, if you like closure and like this kind of stuff, we're hiring. Um, and that's it.